order for you to be properly polarized, you need to be at least somewhat individuated, right? Uh, the, the idea here being that you can't actually surrender something you've never had. So, so meaning, right, one of the big pieces of uh, polarization or erotic friction in the sexual domain, and we're only speaking about it in the sexual domain, we can, of course, talk about it individually and with places and all kinds of stuff. But for the sake of the intimate relationship with life, your sexual partner in sex, what we're looking at is one person, the masculine, right, the, the, the one who penetrates, having the depth and the structure and the wherewithal in a bigger picture, like if we now talk about romantic relationship in the sexual way, you have, or it, it might not even be sexual, sexual, but you know, in, in, in a polarized relationship, you have to have one person who is capable of penetrating through all kinds of bullshit, through uh, resistance, but not resistance as in trauma, uh, but just that, that, you know, that, mm, nah, that kind of you don't know what to do, so there's a little bit of confusion and resistance. And also sexually, right, the, the, the one who penetrates is the one who takes. The one who is taken by the very definition of that play surrenders, gives it up. But of course, if you have nothing to give up because you're kind of an unformed noodle of, un, you know, uh, I don't know how to call it, unexamined, uh, chaotic drama, right? Um, you can be guided and penetrated and aligned. And there is men who enjoy that tremendously. They, they, you know, they see, a, they see a damsel in, in, uh, in uh, borderline distress and they are hard as a rock penetrating, right? And, and var variation on that, right? But of course, the problem is if you penetrate somebody and align them and they don't have internal structure, they can't hold that. And you have to constantly penetrate and align them or they are a complete mess. And you see relationships like that, where the guy constantly has to straighten shit out because the woman isn't capable of actually self-guiding when he's not penetrating her, and no man can penetrate and guide 24-7, right? And should, I mean, poor guy, you know, sexually and life-wise. So individuation, meaning uh, the ability to know who you are and develop psychological and life skills that allow you to live a life where you have internal masculine and feminine, so to speak, um, that allow you to be functional, you know, basic functionality. You can buy milk, pay your bills, have a meal, uh, you know, feed and clothe yourself, uh, articulate your needs, say no, say yes, uh, behave like an appropriate human being. 50% of the time, let's say, or maybe 65% of the time, uh, is, is, the, is the basis of the surrender being an actual surrender, right? Anybody can surrender when they're not formed because there's nothing to give up, you know? And on the other hand, you wouldn't want to trust somebody who isn't formed to penetrate you, right? Most guys can learn basic, what, what are we going to call it, tantric, common, pick-up skills or something like that, right? Most guys can learn enough about structure to kind of bowl over an unsuspecting, chaotic damsel in distress. But that doesn't make a good man. And most of you know that because we've all met one or two of those. And you're like, you're all aligned, right? And then you, you realize that you can trust the guy. No, for a variety of reasons, because either he's a player or he's, um, you know, totally uh, unskilled in other areas of life, or he's fronting, or he's on a power trip, that's also one, or he's just acquiring, you know, tantric pussy for his own, uh, you know, gain or whatever, right? So, 
you know, and I'm saying tantric pussy, but of course this happens in real life too. There's men, their, their only game is power, right? Or, or making gains and stuff like that. You can trust that. So as a man, you also have to have a basic independence, uh, having had your basic needs met, so you're not just, you know, scarfing stuff up out of some unfillable hunger right, and, and things like that. So that, I would say, is absolutely the truth, that when you are properly individuated, the, the polarization is much more powerful and it's much more true. Exactly. It already be surrendered because you can't actually get your shit together, right? which you see a lot, or penetrate simply because... Um, you, it has to be your way, your way, or the highway, and the penetration is kind of the game that, that makes it so that your life is, you know, manageable in some way. Um, that, that makes it a bit questionable, you know. And the same is true within yourself, right? You, you, regardless of where you sit in your sexual preference, because you will have a sexual preference that's either on the surrender aspect or on the penetrative aspect that within yourself for your life you are capable of guiding your own life and you're capable of of giving things up and surrendering things you know in the guiding of your own life so yeah so how can we avoid the bastardization of embodiment <laughs> well we probably can't um, in the in the global sense but also you know, I just finished writing this book. I'm not totally finished yet because I have to do, you know, my editor's edits next. Um, but I had the whole summer to, and we spoke briefly during that summer, I had the whole summer to uh, kind of ponder certain things, you know, and where, where some of the things that I do personally and in business, so to speak, come from. And one thing that I'm very keen on as far as embodiment goes is that that's actually our natural state. Right? So in a certain way, embodiment, there is pitfalls and we'll talk about them, but in a certain way, you have to look at embodiment as something that we never needed to learn because we were in it. Right? When you plowed and you had oxen and you sowed and you, or you hunted or you fished or you gathered or even, you know, you worked in a factory maybe, you walked home, you worked, walked to the factory, you spent most of your life moving. And as everybody knows who uh, moves or doesn't move, right? Just general movement without any frills or techniques or anything, straightens out the system because that's what it's meant to be. When you look at how much ground our ancestors covered right, on a daily basis and how much bodily movement there was till the combination of uh, cars, planes, trains, offices, uh, computers, longer work hours, um, computers at home now, phones, you know, and so on and so on. Uh, you know, I, I once heard somebody say that uh, they think that, you know, those those uh, pictures of the aliens with that triangular heads and the, those spindly legs, it's just because they are, you know, um, a few steps away uh, ahead in the evolution and they no longer use anything other than their big head because it's all computer and, you know, whatever. I heard that once and that kind of made sense because we are certainly in the danger of atrophy of our embodiment faculties. Mm. Right? And that's happening clearly when you look at all domains. So the resurgence of natural movement, you hear that term, right? Or embodiment practices, uh, I saw a guy recently, because Facebook, of course, is the cesspool of all these things, um, who offers tree climbing co uh, classes. So you can go, you can meet him in a park, and for an hour, you get to play like you were a kid in the tree. Now you're a harnessed in, of course, because you're a 40-year-old banker, and when you break... <laughs> 
you know, break your shoulder, it's a little bit, has a little bit more consequences than when you were a little boy. But there's a lot of um, going back to nature, which is fantastic. And so embodiment is our birthright. It's, uh, it, it's the very thing that straightens us out emotionally, physically, mentally. Uh, it keeps us young, you know, and so on and so on. So the, the, the call towards embodiment is a call towards that which we lost, which was natural. Right? So within that concept, there is, of course, a few pitfalls. Number one, when you want to attain something that's already yours with pressure, right? that's like orgasms. Right? Trying to get to an orgasm by trying really hard tends to not work that well, at least not in a woman. So it's a bit unnatural to push that which is natural. And of course, the more pressure you apply to your coming back to nature, the, the less it will happen in a certain way. So the pitfall would be to apply performance standards to relaxation and embodiment. Right? But it's tricky because, of course in this time and age and with everything we have to deal with, you will need discipline for your embodiment practices because you have to make time to do them. And that's time that you're not spending on the computer or on your cell phone or on your Facebook or on your Instagram. So it's, it's a dicey thing to look at because it will rec- the, the becoming na- natural again does take discipline and planning and practice and everything. But within that, you can't apply performance principles. So the danger in the embodiment movement would be to apply performance principles to something that has to do with coming back to natural and coming back to what's already there. The other potential danger that I could see, you know, I would have to think all of this through more to be more you know coherent on this the, the other potential danger would be to confuse and this is steve you know steve talked about this in the embodiment lecture to confuse strong sensation with being embodied mm-hmm. right and that happens a lot power yoga being one of the prime examples right or hot yoga where you essentially you know doing things that make you feel your body based on your body having to uh, push out a whole bunch of neurotransmitters to make up for the inflammation, the injury, and you know the strain and all of those kind of things. So there's certainly a danger to go at embodiment by just creating very loud sensations of the body that are then mistaken for the actual thing. So that would be my best quick answer uh, there. But, you know, in general, um, we have a very um, lovely, what shall we call, Steve? Friend, I guess. Mm -hmm. Acquaintance, close acquaintance, whatever, uh, who is um, 60, what is he, 64? 64 year old. He still travels the world. He goes everywhere. He's constantly somewhere else. And he essentially says, look, I'm 64. And he looks unbelievable. Unbelievable. Right? And his whole thing is minimum effort, maximum result. Right? That's, I mean, there's lots more to it. But he is a good example of what embodiment can look like even in the, in the training fitness industry without being um, invasive or an imposition or brutalizing the system. Right? So there's people like that out there. And then there's other people who say, oh, we're doing natural movements, um, and they do natural movements, uh, but, and I don't want to name name theirs, but there's some famous people who can do all kinds of wild shit with their body, but they're all in their early 30s, and they constantly show videos of them rehabbing themselves from torn shoulder uh, rotator cuffs and stuff like that, because they are going for the strong sensation and dominance over the body versus the long-term embodiment. And the very same thing is true in, let's say, sensual embodiment. You can push it, 
and you can become a world class uh, pole pole dancing aficionado in in the states. You know that the pole dancing classes are very very big, uh, but there isn't much inside. Or you can do very to begin with unsexy internal development that allows your body to be free, which then translates into actual feeling in the body. So those would be the two, you know, the the things to look out for in embodiment. That's a big big topic, right? And uh, there's a few aspects to it, one of which is... I can only speak for myself. I can say a few things on how we travel and stuff like that. But Maybe it would be fun if I said what are two things about you. Okay, and then I say two things about you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, knock yourself out then. <laughs> yeah. My observation would be about Michaela, for instance, and I sometimes say that Michaela is one of the most, well, the, I think the most hard-working person I've worked with or productive person that I've worked with in terms of her ability to shovel a lot of shit, you know. For a um, great deal of discipline and so on. And, of course, it wouldn't be possible to do what she does without that. But I would say um, some part of it is one's uh, personality, um, characteristics, uh, along the various dimensions of one's personality. Uh, some people are more, you know, uh, productive than others by nature, or more, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? Industrious. Industrious. In the terms of the big five, yeah? Mm-hmm. And orderly and so on. So Michaela has very high typology, I would say, towards that. Um, in addition to that, there, uh, she has an awful lot of training, in, uh, which has produced a lot of capacity. Uh, and that's not only, shall we say, with her old teachers and all that, but also in her academic training, and then she's been in a training environment like a therapy environment where she had to, uh, eight hours, nine hours a day for how many, don't know how many years in a row it was you did, you did in that. Was it all with all the time? Yeah. Uh, seeing all these clients and stuff like that. So that also is a good training environment. So there's also some degree of nature, some degree of nurture. And uh, then also this skill development or, you know, she has skills, the way she approaches things and strategies, which is in addition to the nature and nurture. But it's very unlikely that a person is going to be able to do work like Michaela can work because um, of uh, uh, her, I would say, the way she's built, you know. And it's very unlikely that someone will have had the training that she's had and have got out of it what she got out of it, which is also due to how she's built and so on, because those opportunities are not very frequent. Um, and also the environment to produce the learning adaptation, to generate the strategies, the IQ level required to deal with it, etc. You know, and all her early trainings, which provided her with actual competencies that she could go and do things with. I would say those things make it possible. But your also question was how to manage her nervous system and things like that. So, I mean, maybe, I don't know. That's a whole other story. So that's a summary, but it's not everything, but that's off the top of my head observations about yeah. Michaela. I mean, that, yeah, that's, that's not much I can add to it, but I built my capacity very slowly and gradually over many, many years. Right? And, um, you know, like Steve was saying, eight nine, eight, nine clients a day, five days a week for, with, for 50 probably 52 weeks out of the year because I barely took time off because I had to work. I built a, built a practice from nothing in the States. Uh, and so um, I just have, I have incredible concentration and stamina. I, I can concentrate for eight, ten hours a day with no problem at all. I don't have drops. I don't have energetic drops either. My energy runs very, very even and clean for the most part. That's not to say I don't have shit happening, right, and hormones and all kinds of stuff. So that's a combo of discipline and capacity, which you can learn by doing it, right? As far as I manage my nervous system, it's kind of interesting because just a matter of my nervous system being highly sensitized from the teaching... And because I'm sensitive to begin with, 
so that's probably the hardest uh, thing as far as how do we manage it and so how do we manage it well there's a bunch of stuff that I've learned from Steve when we started traveling together but but for myself home cooked meals right a specific kind of meals to uh, certain kind of rituals uh, we have quite strong routines, which I'll get into in a second. And um, non-linear, <laughs> you know. I, th I think that the, the secret to my being sane is non-linear, really, because it, it just relieves my body. And I often don't have time for more. Last night I did it in the shower. I just thank God I had one of those on-demand water heaters. Because I was just in the shower, moving, 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 because that's what was needed. So that, that's the toughest part, is to maintain the nervous system. And um, one of the ways that I personally can maintain the nervous system is that we're traveling together. And so I have a... Um, uh, I, I probably wouldn't travel by myself if Steve, I don't know, runs off and join the monastery or something like that, uh, or the circus, um, more likely. <laughs> I thought we were the circus, but I guess not. Uh, it, it, I probably wouldn't do it because one of the nice things and one of the things that makes it so we can do this is uh, we have each other. I can't talk for him, but it's just, you know, I like having him around. I like traveling with him. I like the routines we have. Um, he's introduced me to weightlifting, which I credit to most of the goodness, you know, in, in, the, in the maintaining of energy and, and work out and go for walks and, you know, go for meals and, you know. But mostly I would say it has to do with the fact that I just tremendously enjoy it, tremendously enjoy the teaching and tremendously enjoy traveling with Steve and, um, and the whole thing that comes with that. And so it doesn't feel like I mean, it feels like an adventure, you know? And so all I can say, if you ask me how, how do you do everything that you want to do is um, enjoy it. So that's, that's the, I would think, the thing that drives everything that I do personally is that bigger picture motivation. You know? yeah, Love. Mm -hmm. In... <laughs> 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 in some form, right? Uh, the love for the, the teaching, the love for the students, the love for the, the, the bringing good, you know, into people's and bringing love into people's lives and everything that comes with it. And, you know, that extends to my dogs and my animals and the farm and everything I do. That's what I can say there. And I probably shouldn't speak about you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe you can say a few things about yourself. Yeah. Well, let me say a few things. All right, the thing that Steve just said... <laughs> the thing that Steve just said... About, well, there's a, f a lot of things you don't know about Steve. And many... <laughs> many we will keep a secret. Yeah. So is that... Um, there's a guy who never stops inquiring, Right. I mean, he's just learning Tibetan. And we were somewhere, it was five in the fucking morning, the first day we were here, or the second day he was here, where he got up because it was whatever in California or, or Vancouver, 11 a.m. in Vancouver. And all I heard for two hours while I'm trying to press a pillow over my head so I can, in the other room, you know, get a little bit more snoozing, I hear him in his room go, meh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever that Tibetan is, stuff. Tibetan <laughs> stuff, right? And and so the 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 discipline and the insane follow through that is Steve, right, um, is very very interesting because I think that when I look at how he manages his energy, is he's on one end endlessly disciplined, and on the other end. Um, He's one of the most efficient people I know, which means he'll never spend any extra energy. Like, he'll figure out how to optimize something, and then he will only do as much as 
absolutely need, need a <laughs> minimum muscular activation necessary. necessary. Right? That's Steve in a nutshell. Minimum muscular activity. Which means I do the dishes, right? Is what that means. <laughs> but that's his secret. Like, I'm joking about that. He, you know, he cooks, I'll do the dishes or something like that. But, um, but that's, I, I, I still have to take a, a leaf out of his book there and, and do on, you know, more and more so. Is that he's, he's so efficient that he doesn't waste any energy, which is very good for me to see. So that's uh, one thing I can disclose about Steve. Somewhere we have a recording where I explain it. Uh, did you write an article for Goop? Oh, I did write an article for Goop about that. Yeah, if you look on my website on the blog, there's an article where I define it in a few sentences. I'm gonna tell you a few things, how do you, I mean, when people say Tantra, it means all kinds of things, right? And yeah, people go to sex. So what I often say is that um, in most traditions, there are two strands of um, disposition. One is leaving the body behind and subjugating the body in order to get attainment or being with the body through the body in order to get attainment or awakening. Tantra is the Hindu branch of working with the body on, on, you know, on getting attainment or, or enlightenment or awakening. And as such, uh, Tantra can be looked at as using all of life and your body and your life as a way to engage, you know, to engage with all of life. And so tantric practices are the practices of moment by moment engagement with whatever is happening within yourself, in a partner and in the world. And so that way you get out of the sex conversation. You can say one aspect of that is of course the relational sexual aspect, but it applies to the way you brush your teeth, the way you speak right now, the way you pick up this pen, the way you move, the way in my case, I always like to say that uh, to me, um, uh, scooping my horse shit, you know, I have two donkeys and a horse, so scooping the, 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 the manure uh, on the field is, is one of the, the things that I enjoy the most as one of those ordinary sacred acts, right? And so to me, Tantra is ordinary sacredness or sacred ordinariness. And that encompasses everything and a very, very small percentage of tantric practice is in the sexual realm. In Neo-Tantra, of course, it's all about uh, spiritualized fucking, but that's not what we're talking about. Right? We're talking about an engagement with life, both as the observer and enjoyer, and as the expressor for the sake of the fullness or emptiness. Yeah, I got an email from somebody asking if I knew a tantrika in LA. And I was like, uh, no. And what, what he meant was a spiritualized whore, essentially. You know, that's not a tantrika. A tantrika, both male and female, are people who have, you know, substantial tantric practice under their belt, not people who give sacred hand jobs. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it, it, you know, it goes, sadly. Wow. It's raining pretty hard. Right before this happened, Michaela was saying, well, you know, it was a little bit raining earlier today, but I don't think the clothes will be too bad. It wasn't that bad, you know. And then as soon as she said it, we were standing out there, and it's just, this happened. Literally, I just had finished. We were sitting there, and I said, ah, it's just a little bit of drizzle. The laundry will be fine. And next thing, it was like, oh! <laughs> Shit. Okay, well. Okay, what was the question? Shadow work? If you look in the original tantric text, which is the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra or Vijnana Bhairava Tantra, depending on how people pronounce it, um, and which you can, you know, there's this beautiful newer translation called the Radiant Sutras, 
you will see that there is a very strong, like past, I think, Sutra 57 or 58, uh, you'll see that it actually goes quite specifically into unexamined or darker aspects. So shadow work, how it's understood these days in a more pop culture setting. I just heard somebody talk about it uh, who is supposedly now teaching shadow workshops and his definition was, well, the shadow is stuff that we have uh, put aside or suppressed. Of course, the Jungian definition of shadow work is things that you're not aware of. Mm. It's the stuff you don't know you don't know. Right? While in most pop culture shadow workshops and stuff, it's the stuff you know but don't want to deal with, which is not the shadow. That's just good old suppression and denial, right? So, which is different. I mean, suppression, denial, or you just don't want to deal with it in a, in a more healthy way, right? So the shadow in its very nature are the things that you're not aware of and hence you can't actually deal with them. It's a little bit like, you know, well, you have this thing behind your head, right? And somebody says, hey, you have this thing behind your head. And you go like this, right? And it's not, you, you can't see it. It's a blind spot, so to speak. Or a unexamined aspect of you that you don't know about. And so in tantric practice how that's dealt with, and it's very dangerous in neo-tantric practice, how it's dealt with. But in actual tantric practice, you're essentially doing practices that make that thing come into view. And so the skillful teacher will essentially give you a series of things to do that very, very gradually make that thing appear. And suddenly, in the middle of a practice or in the middle of your life, you go, oh, shit. Mm. And at that point, it's, it's there and you can deal with it. Right? And so that, that's one aspect of it. Right? The other aspect is that in, in my lineage, one of the main vehicles of, of exploration is deity yoga. And so in deity yoga, what you essentially do is you learn how to empty yourself out and imbue yourself with the attributes of the deity. And as you imbue yourself with the attributes of the deity, two things happen. One is the arbitrary nature of your own psychology and persona become pretty clear because if you can become that you can see that that's also just a thing right that you put on and off so it loosens your moorings of your persona in a certain way but it also informs you of the the deity's attributes and so there are certain deities, of course, that have certain attributes that will have the effect of bringing your shadow into, into you know, existence because the deity has the shadow aspects, uh, you know, the, the collective unconscious shadow aspects in the Jungian sense as part of a higher expression. So, for instance... Kali, right? Everybody knows about Kali. Kali's wrath is the wrath that destroys everything that's not love and also that destroys time. Right? So Kali is a portal into that timeless, untethered space in which pure love and with that pure destruction arises. So that will bring up certain shadows that you have around clinging to certain things, your anger versus the pure expression of uh, destruction, you know, the toxicity of your anger versus the love of your anger, the way your body moves in anger, the way you clench down instead of 
you know, and so on and so on. So deity yoga can be, in, in, in tantric lineages, can be perceived as archetypal shadow work, right, you could say. The, the, the stories of deities are myth, and myth in, in the Jungian tradition is considered uh, unconscious shadow material that has already been brought to the surface and standardized, so to speak, in a way that people can feel their own shadows within uh, the myth and then hopefully extract it for themselves. So that's another aspect of shadow work that's present in Tantra. One of the working assumptions right, in, in different forms of psychology and counseling and uh, ontological studies, and you know, all kinds of different ways of looking at it and slicing it, but what, you, what we're looking at is that um, when you are a small human being uh, and you are in your mother's womb, you are part of your mother, and you are as well part of the whole, whatever that means to you, part of God, part of the universe, whatever. You, you, you're not formed as a human yet. And then you're born, and then you actually separate from your mother, and, but you, you're still, and most women experience that when you know, their babies are young, you still, you feel everything they are feeling, they're feeling everything you feel. You, know, you have children, you know that. And then over time, the child has to realize, that's what is technically called individuation, the child has to realize that they are an entity of their own and that there's other people out there and that they're interacting with the other people and then typically around one and a half, two years, they form themselves as, a, 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 no, right? You, you know, first time your, your kid goes, no, you have reached the point of individuation, right? <laughs> They're suddenly clear on the fact, yeah, exactly. They're suddenly clear that they have their own wherewithal. And at that point, and even before then, and even in the womb, but at around that point, they form a worldview, they form a view about themselves based on what happens out there in the world. So things that are inconsequential uh, for an adult are a big deal for a small child because their worldview is still there's the center of the universe, so to speak, right? Everything that happens, happens because of them. So if you are mad, it must be because they are bad, not because you are in a bad mood. Right. So based on whatever happens, they form a, an opinion of themselves that has, an, um, has a quality of lack or um, shortcoming. Right. So whatever, you know, uh, whatever that would be, uh, you're not good enough, you think. Right. So um, and, and so then and you, we don't know if it's a chicken or an egg thing, you can argue both ways. You can argue that the parents did something that made the child not good enough, or the child perceived something as they are not good enough that you might not have meant, right? It doesn't matter. Either which way, you form a certain imprint. And in that imprint is how love is perceived. So if you're massively neglected other than when you break something and at that point your father gives you massive attention in the form of screaming at you and punishing you, then your imprint of love will be screaming and punishing. And that's formed into the shape of your persona. And you create a whole persona based on, on one end avoiding the pain of that and on the other end wanting to get the love. So you start behaving in ways that gives you the love that you think is the only love you can have, which is you'll act out and your father will punish you. All the while, saying that's not what you want. All the while, yeah. Well, when you're young, you, you, you're at the same time, you, you know, as a child, you're also trying to avoid it. You have all kinds of ways to avoid it, and then you crave it. So as an adult, you're going to find a partner who is going to fit that home pattern of love. That all said is the person who is never good enough will be attracted to somebody who is highly critical, 
right? Or something like that. And the highly critical person is going to feel like the person who is with them can never do right. right? So the highly critical person go, you know, looks at their partner as a loser who can just never get it right. And it's a constant nag and a constant beating up. And, and inside, you know, they're, they're perpetuating the thing of their childhood where they weren't ever able to do right and were constantly criticized. And they are giving their partner whatever their partner got from their parents, which is constant fucking nagging and not being happy with them, right? And so your adult selves, because, you know, we have all kinds of sub-personalities, your adult self goes, I want to be acknowledged. That childhood self will constantly sabotage your acknowledgement or not even hear it based on the need to get the nagging because that's the love food, right? So if we could, that's what I'm talking about with you. So if you, were, if you have chosen your own partner, you have chosen the shape of your love wound. No ifs, whens, and buts. If you were um, married by your parents to an arranged partner with whom you have nothing in common... It will take you a while to shape your partner into that love wound, but you will <laughs> succeed eventually. You will constantly behave and, and bring forth ways that they start behaving towards you the way you need them to. And you'll train them. You give them positive reinforcement in their way, giving you the shit that you want. So that's a given. And... But that's not your situation. I'm assuming your parents didn't arrange your marriage, but you chose each other. Yeah. So you chose each other for whatever shit you give each other. That's just the way it goes. And so now the psychological approach here, of course, is that you go, well, let me identify the things I need, and then let me ask my partner to give me these things. A perfectly logical thing, right? Often you're a therapist, aren't you? Yeah, so you go to somebody and you go, you know, my partner never touches me, I need to be touched. But if I ask my partner to touch me, they don't actually touch me the way I want to be touched, right? And then any good therapist will sit both people down and the therapist will say, okay, how would you like to be touched, right? And then you go, well, I want to be touched like this. And then the therapist goes, okay, to, the, you know, to her, okay, touch him like this. Is, is that the kind of touch you want, right? And eventually you'll go, oh, yeah, that's the touch I want, right? But then they go, you go home, and then she'll touch you, but it's not the way you really want to be touched because you don't actually want to be touched because if she touches you, the child's part of you isn't satisfied because the child part of you doesn't, doesn't have a socket for that touch, loving touch. The child part has a socket for being slapped, let's say, right? or, or diminished or something like that. So it's actually quite, um, it, it's therapeutically very healthy to, to articulate your needs and it's therapeutically very healthy to, for both partners to know what the other person knows and be respectful and all of that. But on a much deeper level, you'll have to essentially understand that the very thing that you want can't be given to you because you fundamentally don't have a chip for it. You know? So you can, over time, build a socket for that thing with behavior modification, with tantric practices, with nonlinear, with shamanic practices, blah, blah, blah. But um, fundamentally, the easiest way out of that particular thing is that you give the very thing that you feel devoid of. You give it. You give it. You don't want to give it because you're going, why should I touch you if you never touch me? Fuck you. It's scarce enough as it is. You don't want to deplete your own touch supplies. But the only way out of, let's say, if you're touch deprived or if you want to be touched by a partner in certain ways, that you touch your partner. But not the way you want to be touched, but the way your partner needs to be touched. So when we take this particular thing that I just told you as an underpinning, 
than in sexual practice or in these polarity or heart or intimacy practices. The best course of action for a relationship is that you become sensitive to your body in its entirety and sensitive to your partner's body in its entirety. And you learn how to put your... How shall I say this? Your locus of attention in the other person. And they put their locus of attention in you, and hence nobody is self-contracted. Because you're not going... She needs to give me this thing. You're going, let me feel her and play with that. And she goes, let me feel him and play with that. And then you're not in that contractive space of the lack, but you're in the abundant space of the give and the feel. Yes. You know, once again, if you look at this from a pattern interrupt space... Um, of course, once you're in a relationship, you're in a certain rut, uh, both positively and negatively. There's things that reliably work, and there's things that reliably work to piss your partner off. Right? And, you, and that's your repertoire. Right? You have the things that actually work, and you have the flavors that are guaranteed repellents. And so when you engage in different flavors, you're training your body to have a different posture and that posture is not a posture that is known in the interrelational. You, it, 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 you know, it messes up the cogs and wheels situation, so to speak. And when a cog and wheel situation is messed up, other things can happen. Right? So flavors are very, very good on, on the interpersonal uh, level from the pattern interrupt aspect. It's also good because usually if you don't get a certain flavor, you get somewhat craven around it. So getting other things is very nourishing. It's also good for your own body to explore expressions that you have suppressed so that would go a little bit into the shadow aspect or lack of skill aspect where you're going, well, I'm not good at um, decisive action. So I'm going to play with the flavor of decisive action, which strengthens your decisive action muscle and gives your nervous system additional bandwidth in the realm of decisive action. And then that plays into the rest of your relationship, not only sexually, um, and so on and so on. So you can train your body for a wider variety through flavors. You can pattern interrupt the well-oiled wheels of the relationship um, and you can use flavors to nourish um, deficiencies. I don't think I can give a general answer to that because it depends on the trigger, it depends on the trauma pattern, it depends if it's a fresh trauma or an old trauma, it depends also on the kind of engagement. Uh, you are having. So there's too much of a variety for me to give you a okay. detailed answer. I can, however, point to the very principles of what we're learning here, which is sensitivity, so intimacy with yourself and the other, and the heart. Yeah. Right? If you're sufficiently trained in the realm of sensitivity, you're, you're sensitized enough to feel not only yourself accurately, which is invaluable beyond anything else, right? That's whatever. Life and Tantra 101 is you can actually feel yourself, right? And then you can feel another. And then you can... And when I say keep your heart open, I don't, I'm not saying that the heart shouldn't close. It, it, it has to close in the face of an injury, like your eye has to close in the face of somebody poking you with a stick, Right, So that whole bullshit of love with an open heart regardless of what happens is written by you know, an abuser towards an abuse, so to speak, because you have to close your heart when somebody pokes it with a stick. But you have to have wherewithal that the heart is closed. Right? You need to at least be able to say, my heart is closed 
for all kinds of reasons. Somebody poked me with a stick or I got triggered or both. And now I will act as a human with a closed heart. Right? And typically when our heart closes in pain, we do horrible things, all of us. Right? Then you have to make amends afterwards or not. But, you, but over time, when you become aware of the particular triggers that close the heart because of the pain, because of the whatever, then you can relax and pull that apart and either avoid the person who pokes you with a stick or uh, remedy the thing that does that or not expose yourself to that or um, identify why that hurts and relax that because it's doable, but certain things are not doable, right? Somebody slaps you uh, in anger, there is no reason to relax in order to deal with the slap better, right? You just step away from that person and you ideally find a way for them to not slap you, which means they either have to deal with whatever that is, you have to deal with what that is, or you leave them, right? In, in the slapping sense, right? But that's true for all triggers. Right? So I think that's the most I can say. About.